and hello Chattanooga friends. It is such an honor and pleasure to be with you on Juneteenth. I give you greetings from my home in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, live in the office. Pleasure to be with you. So as we kick off today, I've got to start by asking, how many of you have moved at some point in your life? If you would just raise your hands or, or, or share if you have. This could be moving from a house to a house or from a different state to a new place. Do we have any hands up there? Oh yeah, now my follow-up question is, how many have you actually like the process of moving? If we see any hands come up here, I'm gonna tell you we have some sick people in the crowd today. Well, I am the oldest of three daughters and we always in my family have something going on. I'm very, very fortunate to have a supportive family. And a few years ago, it was a year that all three girls moved. So my middle sister who lives in Knoxville, Tennessee, it was finally her turn and my parents had one more load to make for them. So they go to show up at her house and they realize when they got to her home that nothing was even boxed. So she said, well, I just thought you could actually help us box as well. So it was one of those kinds of days. Have you all had those <laughs> when the job gets bigger and bigger? And you know, with moves, you work so hard. So by the end of the day, my friends, they were exhausted. Um, it was the kind of day where you put on sweats, you order a pizza, and you just began to relax. So that night, everyone went to bed early, and they laid down in their pillows. And just as they're kind of settling in for the night, relaxing those muscles, that's when the noise started. It was an unusual noise. It was very loud, and it was almost like a wailing of some sort. Uh, they thought it was a dog, but they weren't quite sure. So my dad and brother-in-law went up to try to find the source of the noise and they couldn't find it. But the wailing went on all night long and no one slept. So the next morning, everyone woke up very naturally, the capital G word, grouchy, right? Because they were tired and thinking, what kind of neighborhood have we moved into? What kind of neighbors would let this noise go on? And if it was a dog, how irresponsible. So a few minutes later, another concerned neighbor came over to find out if they heard the noise and what was going on. I think she was also making sure that it wasn't my sister's dog, the yellow lab Cooper. And they, she said, you know, this is not okay. So I'm gonna figure out what was going on. Well, about two hours later, that same neighbor came back and she had a very different tone. Uh, her whole demeanor was different. And she let my family know that in fact, it, it was a dog that they heard all through the night. It was a dog named Allie, who's lost its sidekick, another yellow lab, of 10 years. Did you know that Allie was grieving all through the night the only way she knew how heartache and loss of her furry friend? And I'm telling you, all of a sudden, it moved from anger and frustration to empathy from finger pointing to helping hands. I mean, we had group texts going for Allie and Bark's box delivered. And in that moment, it hit me, my goodness, how many times have we falsely judged others based on outward whales? I've done it and it's been done to me. And I can tell you, my friends in our country today, in our communities, we are wailing. We are hearing deep cries of pain. And we've got to take time to understand the whys behind the noise and the hows for bringing them together to build better outcomes. You see, I believe wailing is one of the precursors to winning if we let it, because it's a sign that something is not right. There's something going on. And if we can get underneath the surface and really listen and understand, this can be the breakdown that leads to our breakthrough. But change starts within. And so today, as we begin to look at how do we bring all perspectives together? How do we listen? How do we understand? And how do we not just compromise, but build breakthrough new realities that's better than anything we've seen? We've got to do some self-checks to, to really evaluate our perspectives. And so today, I just want to share four tips as we, as we look and we maybe even hear noise and we're not sure how to react and respond, that instead we're going to pause and really take some time to think about and understand the times we're living in and, and what's going on. Then we're gonna do the hardest step and that's check our filter. We're gonna evaluate why we're seeing things or responding in a certain way. Then we're gonna take a step back and say, hey, could there be other ways of seeing the same situation? And is it bad or wrong or just different? And ultimately, how can we adapt 
so that we honor and we include all people and that we combine our collective strengths to build better outcomes. And so as we go forward today, it's gonna to be a lot like crossing our arms. So if you would this, this morning, go ahead and cross your arms with me. And so I'm sitting here, I'm giving you, I don't mean to give you a cold nonverbal, but this is how I cross my arms. And so I hope you're crossing them as well. I'm curious, which arm is on top? For me, it is always my right arm. So I'm going to ask you to do something really funky right now. If you would cross and put the opposite arm on top. Okay, well, you want to do it with me? Here we go. Three, two, one. Opposite arm. Over. I'm curious, how does that feel for you? Is it easy, hard, a little awkward? You need to shake it off? Okay, let's do one more time, opposite arm over. How does that feel? Any easier, still a little weird? Everything we're gonna talk about today is like putting your opposite arm over because we're gonna, we're gonna stretch ourselves to think and to see in new ways. And the good news is that as we continue to do it, it's gonna become like muscle memory. So one more time, opposite arm, and let's get started with pausing. So I'm curious, my friends, have you ever had a situation, uh, maybe even this morning, you've had a, a talk with someone that has just rubbed you in every kind of wrong way? I mean, what they say, our, our, our 11 year old son says, it's, it triggers you. Uh, maybe someone says something or does something that goes against a deeply held belief. In that moment, what happens physiologically? Well, we go into kind of fight or flight mode. We go into the emotional center of our brain called the limbic system, some call this rat brain. And in that moment, when we are triggered or we have something that, that really frustrates us, it never ends well when we, when we react or when we say something in that emotional center. In fact, I'm curious, how many of you have ever had a moment where um, someone rubbed you wrong and you responded back in that moment? Just me, maybe a couple of us. And the follow-up question is, how did that go for you? <laughs> how did that end for you? Um, if it's like me, usually not well, because sometimes we do or say things that we don't even really mean, and, and we cannot take those things back. So in these times, we want to be able to pause and give our brain some space to really process what's going on. In this time, if you've heard of the five whys, I always like to ask this question, why am I so flared up right now? Why is this bothering me? And keep di digging deeper and deeper. Um, really even pausing just to look at the world around us right now and all that is happening and, and all that's being experienced. Days like today are so important to pause and say, oh man, things are not right. We've got to pause and really begin to rethink how we position as we go forward to create something that's equitable for everyone. And so we want to replace our immediate responses and reactions with time to really get our mind in a good place. I love what um, Holocaust survivor and psychiatrist Viktor Frankl said. He said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our power to choose our response. And in our response, lies our growth and freedom. My friends, there is power in pausing. So I encourage us all to pause today and to think about a situation where you may need to hit that pause button. After we pause, we have a little bit more brain space to do what I believe to be the hardest step of the process, and that is to check our filter. By filter, I mean just like our paradigm, and a paradigm is just like a good old pair of glasses. It impacts the way that we see everything. Now, our paradigm is constructed of so many things. It could be our family of origin, our religion, our ethnicity, our generation, um, the area of the country that we're from, our past hurts insecurities, failures, all of these experiences come together to shape a lens of how we see the world. What I find so interesting is, you know, how many of you wear contacts, raise your hand, or glasses? I'm in that club for sure. And to keep my prescription up to date so that I can keep getting contacts, I have to go and get my eyes checked annually. And I thought, what a good practice that could be for our paradigm is that we should be checking it because all so often we forget to pause and say hmm am i seeing self and others clearly or over time have my experiences started to make some things fuzzy 
And so I would encourage you to do the brave work of checking your paradigm. Also what begins to construct our filter or the way that we see the world, ourself and others around us is what's called bias. In its simplest form, bias is just favor for or against something or someone or a group of people. Um, there's typically two types that we talk about, conscious bias and unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is simply, we don't even really know that, that we're doing it or, or seeing something in a certain way. You see, we're exposed to as many as 11 million pieces of information at any time, but our brains can only deal with 40. So look around the room right now. You know, I'm looking in my office, I've got uh, pencils, I've got stickers, calendars, there's a floor here, there's a desk, there's lights, there's all kinds of things around me that are very stimulating. So what unconscious bias does is it helps us begin to filter down to the things that we need to, to see and, and connect with to kind of get through our day to day. So we're gonna talk about there's some good parts about that and then when we need to be careful with unconscious bias. So unconscious bias is kind of like, um, have you ever been in the market for a car? I'm a beetle bug girl myself. So you know, if you've ever been in the market for a car and you're out and about, you see that car, everywhere, right? Has that ever happened for you? Oh, look, there's that car. Oh, look, there's that car again. Maybe that's a sign I need to get that car. Well, that's actually unconscious bias because you're filtering all the many things that can be vying for your attention down to the one thing that you need to do to make a decision. Maybe you are in a dating relationship. And um, I'm so blessed to just got married this year and everything when I was dating my husband was, oh, I saw him everywhere. Oh, that song, oh, that smell, oh, that book, everything reminded me of him. That's unconscious bias at work. Also, a really uh, adulting thing I did a few years ago was I bought my first toilet. <laughs> All the things we do. And I tell you what, I, until I went through this process, I didn't know that there were elongated bowls and there were round bowls. But when I started doing the research, I started noticing it everywhere. So I was speaking at a conference a few years ago and in this conference center, I came out and I, I was just so amazed at those elongated toilet bowls. And I was telling some of the attendees like, did you see those, those toilet bowls? So elongated and great. And they looked at me like, oh, the speakers they bring in these days are really scary. But you see, in my head, I was filtering things down to make a decision. And that's what I began to see. So unconscious bias can help us in, in our busy day to day to focus on the things we need to do and to be alert and aware of danger. However, it can also become a challenge when we start tipping over to the point of, let's say on the toilet front, only elongated toilets are the only, the only way, these are the best way. So when we began to forecast out in, in group. And so we wanna be very careful with that. You see, every scientific breakthrough starts at the paradigm level. And it's so rare that we pause to check it. So my greatest challenge, if you hear nothing else I say today is this, my friends, let's all do the work. Sit down with a piece of paper and a journal and let's check our lens. How are things going in our mind? How are we seeing self, others? Is it accurate or over time has it been distorted? Have things become jaded? Are we seeing people for who they are? Often we'll run into blind spots because sometimes we don't know what we don't know because we've been operating this way for so long. So ask a friend, have discussions with those who you trust, safe people. Have you heard anything that I've said consistently that, that may not be positive towards other people or, an, or even myself? Um, getting people involved in the process is huge to help us see more clearly. As things emerge, I, I would encourage you to, to bias bust. And this just means um, one of the best way to do this is, is hanging out with people who are different than you. Um, similarity attraction theory would say that we, we typically hang with people who are a lot like us. So when we're doing that all the time, we're, not, we're mi missing the richness that comes from getting to know other people. So to bust a bias, if one emerge, emerges, go hang out with the people or explore the thing or try this new, this new um, adventure that you've been nervous to do or, or hang out with because sometimes it can be scary when we're trying something new. But to bust a bias, that's what uh, one of the best ways to do it. So I would encourage you to really, really do the hard work and be brave as you check your paradigm. You may find nothing, may be clear as day, or you may find some challenges there. 
So be brave and do the work, my friends. You know, I once heard a pastor say, when you think about it, the sun, it's so bright and it's so big. But if you take just a little quarter and you put it over your eyes and you look up at the sun, do you know that that tiny coin can block your entire view of the sun? When we're checking our filter, my friends, we're simply saying, is there any coin that's getting in the way of seeing self and others in a fair and accurate light? What are your coins? Let's do the work. So how many of you have seen this image? It's a really popular image. You can Google it and, and it is both an older and a younger woman. Who knows, maybe there's even a third image that we could find in here. So how many of you, when you look at this, kind of quickly see the older woman? I do, when I, when I immediately zoom in, that's what I see naturally. How many of you naturally see the younger woman? And then how many of you can kind of see both women in this image? Well, it took me forever on this image. Again, just by nature, when I zoom in, I see the older woman and I wanted to see the younger woman. So I was tilting my head, staring and focusing on it. And finally, I was able to see both. And that's kind of what we talk about when we, when we hear about this term multivocal leadership. It's this concept that we have to, as leaders, be able to understand and see and adapt to the multiple views and needs around us. But what's more interesting to me about this image is it's not the image itself, but the study behind it. And so when they introduced this image, um, they had two groups of people split apart. Half of the group got the sketch on the left, half of the group got the sketch on the right. They had access to that sketch for 10 seconds, and then they went and they saw the image in the center. Now, what do you think? The image on the left, this sketch here, if you can see my mouse, if you looked at this for 10 seconds, what do you think you see when you look in the middle? Older or younger woman? Typically older, right? So what about over here? You have access to this image for 10 seconds, and then you go look at the image in the center, and what do you think you see? typically the younger woman, right? So when you think about it, that's called priming. 10 seconds of priming impacted how group after group saw the image in the middle. Imagine how a lifetime of priming impacts how we began to see the world. And we've got to be aware of that because sometimes we could both be in the same situation. Have you ever actually been in the same meeting with someone and you walk away like, wow, that was the best meeting I've ever been to. And the other person was like, oh, that was horrible. <laughs> so we can be in the same room, the same experience, and have two different takeaways depending on that filter. Sometimes we can both be right, right? So is this a six? For sure. Is it a nine? Yes. A lot of it just depends on where you're standing and where you're coming from. So after we pause, and we check our filter, the next step is to perspective take. And this means we're gonna step back and try to see this, this number from different angles. And so when we perspective take, it's kind of like, you know, we've heard a lot about try to walk in someone else's shoes. And, and, and I love that concept. It's, it's very hard to do. It actually requires great amount of imagination. And a lot of the workshops that I do with clients, we actually do impromptu exercises. So we'll have a, a young woman in the group tell us what it was like to be at the first man on the moon. So she's having to think outside of her experience and quickly go into character and explain what, what would it, it was like to, to be there and to say those, those famous words that, that have gone down in history, one small step. And so things like that can have simulations uh, of seeing what it may be like to grow up in this time period with access to or lack of access to these resources in this setting. So it requires great imagination and we need to bring imagination back. Another great way to uh, perspective take is just baking into our model, asking before assuming, um, taking time to listen. And as we listen, we want to be active listeners. We want to not be thinking about the next question or our to-do list. I mean, we want to be present as we listen. Repeat back what the person said. Can you help me understand? Show them with your nonverbals that you are 100% with them. 
and also be empathetic. And being empathetic and compassionate as people share their stories. Um, another thing that often comes up as we perspective take or when we take that step back to consider alternative views of the same situation is that we've got to be aware of what's called the vicious and the virtuous cycle. So what this means is our thoughts impact our feelings and our feelings impact our behaviors. So my friends, if our thoughts are negative about another person or a group, and by the way, what the research shows is if we see one person negatively, we often see their entire group negatively. So when we have that negative thought, we're going to feel negative about the person. So you better believe we're going to behave negatively towards them. So if I am in an office and I'm feeling kind of negative about someone, they are going to quickly pick up on those vibes that I'm putting out. And what do you think they're going to do? They're going to put up a wall because their defenses are going to go up. You see, our brains are wired five times more for negative, negative thoughts and negativity than positivity. So we have to be very intentional about directing our thoughts down positive paths. And when we do that, oh, our behaviors are going to follow. Because what happens when the other person's wall comes up, then they begin to reinforce the very things that we were thinking negatively about them. So then we start thinking and behaving and they start thinking and behaving. And this is called a negative cycle. This impacts marriages, relationships, um, oh, all kinds of things. So to get out of this negative cycle, it takes one person seeing the other person in a positive light. Oh my goodness, can you imagine if we all just gave each other the benefit of the doubt? If we all just said, wow, gosh, maybe they are just having a rough day. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and then you're gonna think positively about them and you're gonna behave in that way. By doing this positive cycle, you're going to begin to disarm them. And people typically do what? Unless you're dealing with a narcissist or a sociopath, which is a different workshop, people typically respond because they see you are going out of your natural form to meet them where they are. So I've got to ask, is there anyone that you need to see in a more positive light? And what would happen if you do? And what would be the impact if we collectively began to see others in a more positive light? Now, when we perspective take, another wonderful tool to do this is to story share. Now, did you know that story sharing actually unites the brains between the storyteller and the listener, making it one of the most long-standing and pure forms of communication? So it's one of the best tools to bridge any type of difference. Um, so think about how creatively you could do this. I love um, StoryCorps, the Great Listen Campaign. Um, they've done all kinds of things where they set up listening stations across the country. They've done a great Thanksgiving listen. I know Chattanooga has done some wonderful things like this. Um, you literally set up a booth and you go in and listen. Could be with a family member, could be with a total stranger, but the point is you are actually just taking time to listen to someone's story. Oh my goodness. When we listen, we begin to understand, oh, I, I get why they may be coming at it from this angle. And it, it produces great empathy and understanding and bridge building. So could you just do a listening campaign at your company or in your community? I think it's also a good exercise in our, in our society to learn to be listeners. It requires great discipline, but in every listening campaign I've seen or be a part of, so many stories are uncovered that people haven't heard before, that people can relate to or learn from. You can think about the humans of New York, just pictures and stories. It's a beautiful way to do it. Um, looking in your community between the elders and the youth, are we sharing what we've learned and we, are we putting intentionality around that? I love uh, an activity Soul Pancake did. They just put up this big ball stand with all kinds of balls in it. And each ball had a question. They plopped two strangers down in, in, in the ball bin and they just talked to one another. That's it. One ball, pick it up, what's the question, and share back and forth. So I would encourage you with all that we're talking about today to be creative with it and have fun. So we've paused, we've checked our filter, 
we've stepped back and now it is time to adapt. And I love this quote from David Livermore. He read, uh, wrote a wonderful book called Driven by Difference. I highly recommend it if you get a chance. He said, culturally intelligent innovation begins from changing our impulse from why can't you see it like I do to help me see what I may be missing. Together we can transcend and include our individual perspectives and upbringings to see the world and how we can work together to come up with more innovative solutions to solve uh, problems big and small. So after we pause, filter check, step back, and now it is time to adapt. And this is where we really move from, from diversity to inclusion and how that inclusion drives innovation. So when we're adapting, we're combining our multiple views, not just to, to compromise, but to actually create breakthrough new realities. Now, sometimes coming together is super easy, right? Uh, a great way to do this is just building on commonalities or similarities or things that we can all relate to. In workshops, um, I do a simple activity. I would encourage you to do this with your teams or in your communities is just put a random group of people together, give them, usually give them about two minutes and say, okay, I want you to tell me how many things you have in common. Oh, it's such a pleasure to watch this unfold. It, it starts, I've seen funny humor, crying, everything in between. So what do you have in common? because at the end of the day, we have a lot more in common than we do different. And often we're getting so distracted by the surface level noises that we're missing all of the things that bind us together. So build on the things that we have in common. This is a common way that they lead peace talks. Um, when you can bring together diverse leaders and maybe have totally, totally different ideas of um, how we need to, to get to a solution, but they can agree that we want to leave the world a better place for our grandkids. So where do you start the conversation? About their grandkids. So what do you have in common? The second tool to adapt is switching from um, this or that thinking to maybe this and that thinking. Or maybe yes, but we could never do it because to yes and. So for example, I, uh, I work in the generational space. I help bridge generational gaps. So yes and thinking for me means that mentoring is not just traditional mentoring where we're, we have our elders share it down, that's a part of it, and reverse mentoring that we can certainly learn from those who are rising up. So yes and thinking means that learning from one another is not dependent on age or status that we can all learn from one another. So commonalities, yes, and. And the third tip is third alternative thinking. And this is a, a brilliant um, concept that Covey created, and you can check it out in this book, Third Alternatives. And it simply means when we have two staunch views and we just cannot agree. So maybe back to the toilet community, it would be the round is the only way to have a toilet bowl, or this is the only way in the elongated community, and we are not going to bend. So what Covey says is first alternative is my way, second alternative is your way, third alternative is a better way. And it starts by asking simply that question, is there a higher way? And would you be willing to go on a journey with me to figure out what that could be? So this is putting all of our preconceived ideas aside and it's gonna go in a room with a whiteboard and having some empty paper and saying, okay, is there a higher way? Yes. Okay, what could that look like? This is where you let ideas flow. There's no judgment on ideas. You're just putting them out. Can we do better? What does success look like? What third alternatives exist? Um, sometimes we get so stuck into thinking in these boxes that have already been created, but could there be something brand new created? And that's when we arrive at what Covey calls synergy, where one plus one equals 100. Now, as you're having this discussion, you want to frame your constraints and your aspirations in the same sentence. What research shows is that helps push us out of path dependency. Um, so add those things together and then answer with three words, we can if. So for example, again, in, in the work that I do, um, bridging generational gaps, um, many companies I'm working with want to grow, but they're having a hard time keeping millennials around. So how do we grow when we're having significant turnover with uh, the millennial generation? Well, that frame those two together and say, well, we can if we recruit them a certain way. Okay, well, we can do that if. So you see what's happening here instead of saying, well, we could never do this because we can if. 
This is how we reach breakthrough new realities. So pause, filter check, step back and adapt. Adapt. I tell you what, it's, it's a pretty little chart, isn't it, for a PowerPoint, but it is so hard to live out. And I had the opportunity to live this out recently. Um, I was hired to do a, a speaking tour with the Northeast Athletic Conference. This means I was working with Division I athletes um, who, uh, who are in the Gen Z generation. And I know um, what their learning style is. I study it. I could tell you about it. I've got a book on it. I know that I have eight seconds to get them the content in a way that they can hear and understand, and then it needs to be switched quickly. But I'll tell you what, I was nervous about this one just because that is not my natural style or preference. And so you all, I worked so, so very hard to prepare for this keynote and it launched in, uh, in Baltimore. So I'm up giving this, I'm on stage with all kinds of lights and hundreds and hundreds of students around me. About 30 minutes into my one hour keynote, a speaker's worst nightmare happened. Any guesses? You all, I totally lost them. And I'm not talking just like one or two on their phones. I mean, I lost the entire crowd. And all I remember feeling was this bright light shining on me, almost like I was having an outer body experience. I mean, I was sweating in places I didn't even know you could sweat. It was awful. Everything felt slow motion. I don't even know what words were coming out of my mouth because they were very, very slow. And so I somehow wrapped up the keynote and I ended up alone in a McDonald's parking lot in my car with an ice cream cone thinking, hmm, maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Maybe, maybe it was okay. Well, the next morning I am, um, I'm um, back at the airport and I had a, an email from my client and in the subject line, it simply said, how do you think last night went? Question mark. And you all, I thought I was going to be sick. You see, I take my work so seriously and I work so hard behind the scenes to understand the audience and to relate and to deliver the content in a way that resonates. So I was so disappointed because I knew we needed to talk that I didn't think it went that well. So we hopped on the phone and she said, you know, Jessica, I wanted to share some feedback with you. Um, first, we wanted to let you know everyone loved you as a person. I thought, oh no, I've heard this before. Are we breaking up? <laughs> and she said, but you know, ultimately the students did not feel like there was enough interaction. My friends, something hit me at that point. Um, let's call it my trigger. And I was triggered. And I'll be honest, my thought process was, really? Did they now? Because when I was in college, we just listened when a speaker came. We just honored that, the, the speaker. But in my head, all I could see was this process. And do you all know where I was stuck? I was stuck in the filter check. You see, the students did nothing wrong. The issue was with me. You see, I was very nervous and I would say insecure about speaking and delivering the content in a way that a generation I didn't feel like I could relate to could understand. I, I was in a vulnerable position and it did not go well. So when I stepped back, I could see, oh my goodness, if I really care about the message that I am preaching, then I've got to figure out how to adapt it. Because if I teach it my way, it's going to slow down the growth and the development of the next generation. So I've got to get out of the way. And so I went back to the drawing board. I asked the client, could you help me? Could your student athletes help me? Could the professors help me? And sure enough, they did. And they said, you've got good content. We just have to help you chunk it out a little bit more. So chunk it out, we did. And I went back out because I had nine more to go. And the next one, I had a, a Gen Zer say, you know, that wasn't even boring. <laughs> oh, what a win. And from there, I gotta tell you, things started going. This is a, a picture of my friend Sadiq in Staten Island. Word started to get out about this, this teaching about life after college and relating in the multi-generational workforce. And many recent graduates said, oh my goodness, we did not realize that you needed to wear a tie when you go to work, particularly in Manhattan. So we worked together and they worked with the professors to donate ties for this event. The coolest part, my friends, is that the professors came, not only did they donate ties, but they taught these young men how to tie a tie. 
So it wasn't YouTube. It was their professor and their friend. And word started spreading. These events got big and broad. We had to start hosting multiple events. And I think to myself so many times, what if I, my views, my paradigms, my insecurities had kept me from this experience? So my friend, I challenge you to, to do this hard work. It's going to be going to be scary. It's going to be hard. It's going to be vulnerable and you can do it. If you would, we're going to close out with the arm exercise one more time. Take that opposite arm over and just let it rest a minute. Take that opposite arm over one more time. Each time, does it get a little bit easier? It does. And before you know it, it will become automatic for you. And so I ask you this, if we only hear things uh, and do nothing with it, what a shame. This calls for action. So what is one bold move that you can and will take after this awesome Diversify conference today? My personal challenge to you in honor of our furry friend, Ali, is that you will pause, filter check, step back and adapt, that you would ask and not assume, and that you would meet people where they are regardless of the noise. Thank you so much, and Darian, I'll kick it back to you.